New York Times best-selling author, and he's written all sorts of uh, books like Rediscovering Catholicism, but this one is Rediscover Jesus, and it's very short, and uh, we have it for all of you this morning. So at the end of uh, at the end of the um, class today, uh, it's through the generosity of uh, one of our wonderful parishioners here, members of our church, and so they want to remain anonymous. So right. Okay. But they're here. So anyway. Um, but thank you so much. So thank you to them. Uh, hopefully God will bless them. We pray. So make sure you say a prayer for them uh, and their family. But you all get one of these books today. Only take it if you're going to read it. If you're not going to read it, don't take it. Because we can give it to somebody who's going to read it. So if you're not planning on reading it, don't take it. But, uh, there, so, there, so this is at the end of the class. You're going to go over to that table and pick up the book. Uh, and then for those of you who can, if you please make a donation and we'll give it to Catholic Charities. Okay? Like a $2 donation, $3 donation. Okay? Whatever. I, I have found, um, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why... Uh, for, for example, in my last parish that uh, we charged big bucks for the religious education classes for kids. We had a big fee if you wanted to sign your kids up for religious ed. And there was no forgiveness. So nobody got a free ride. You had to pay. Even 10 bucks a month, but you had to pay. And the reason is, is unless you paid, I found people didn't take it seriously. So, if you make a donation, you're more likely to read it, really, because for some reason, you know, we have this idea that if it's free, it must not be good, okay? So that's to combat your, your, the negativity in your mind, put a donation in the box, and we'll give it to uh, Catholic Charities. We'll make uh, Deacon Tom very happy. So again, it's a wonderful book, and... At a time when so many people are spiritually disillusioned and searching for ways to live, love, work, and play that nurture the soul rather than destroy it, Matthew Kelly once again delivers a powerful book that encourages us in our wariness, challenges us in our comfort, and invites us to rediscover the beautiful possibilities God places before us daily. Rediscover Jesus is a profound invitation to seek deeply personal answers to our deeply personal questions. Each page seems to effortlessly reach deep into our lives, providing spiritual wisdom and practical insights that help us get to know both Jesus and ourselves in a new way. Can everybody hear me well? Because some people were complaining last uh, week that the volume wasn't high enough on the microphone. Can you hear well? No, it's too soft. Is there a way that we could turn it up a little bit? Uh, Bayani? Okay, he'll try to turn it up. Okay. Uh, so, this is for all of you. Remember, we're going to pass this out at the end of class today. The other announcement is, you know that we have our penance service here today at St. Joseph, husband of Mary. So uh, this is a great thing today. So you can get a lot of things taken care of today. So after class, I'd encourage you to go and have your confession heard. I'm going to be going from 11 to 1 and then in the evening as well to hear confessions. But there's lots of other priests over there. And I think a couple of them are hard of hearing. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure they'll, they'll have a big line. Uh, I, didn't I tell you that uh, I, I was invited to hear confessions at Christ the King? And... Um, and at, at Christ the King, 
it was, this was, I was there in the morning, and of course I heard confessions in the morning, and then was for like three hours, and then uh, as I was leaving, a few people got upset. I said, I have to, I, I've already, it's already been three hours, I have to take a break, but I'll be back in the evening. And I said, don't worry, there'll be other priests here, because there were other priests signed up to be there. Well, I got there in the evening, there's a lot of people, and nobody else showed up. None of the other priests, it was only me. And this lady sat down and she began to tell me her whole story, you know. From, she started from Genesis and was headed to <laughs> Revelation. <laughs> and so I got up after that and I said, look folks, see how many people are here? There's only one of me. So I don't need to know where it happened how it happened, or with whom it happened. <laughs> Just say what happened. <laughs> so that's for uh, uh, all of you today too. If you see that there is a lot of people there, don't mon monopolize the time. Just uh, you know, get to the point. It's not, um, not for us to make a laundry list of everything that we have done, but to get uh, that which is bothering us, those things that we have done that are weighing us down, and to clean our, to clean our soul. Um, and it's a good thing. None of us think twice about, or most of us, I would say, especially here in the United States, about taking a shower every day. You know, I take one every day out of charity. Today I took one thinking of, about all of you, okay? What about our soul? Our soul needs a shower as well. So if you're, if you're kind of confused about confession, what to do, how to do it, we have a guide there in the back that another parishioner has provided for us. Thank you so much. And you can take one and then uh, review it and prepare yourself before you, you go in there. Okay? Uh, so, well, good. I'm glad we're all here. Thank you for being here this morning. We'll be looking at Abraham today. Uh, whom we call the father of our faith. And so, let's pray today. We thank the Lord for bringing us here for this time of grace and mercy, of rediscovering. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today, for this great privilege of being here, for the nourishment which is your word. As we glorify you now and always, we say glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, shall be world without end. Amen. And so, uh, we are going to be uh, talking today about Abraham, but before that I want to tell you about uh, Friday. You know, Friday is a very uh, sacred day for me. And you know why? Because it's my day off. <laughs> and normally what I like to do on Friday is, I, since it's my day off, I like to treat myself. So, uh, I go to Starbucks. <laughs> and so I was at Starbucks waiting to get my uh, skinny latte. Skinny, okay. Uh, and I'm in line and, and I was getting ready to uh, go to the Stations of the Cross because it's Friday and it's Friday during Lent. And so I'm in line in the Starbucks and I struck up a conversation with somebody that was in the line as well. And he asks me, he says, well, what are you up to today? Or something like that, you know, what are you doing today? And I said, oh, I'm going to the stations. And he says, oh, which one? Texas Station? <laughs> Santa Fe Station? <laughs> Boulder Station? <laughs> and I said, no, you've got the wrong idea. <laughs> Stations of the Cross. <laughs> but so it was a very interesting. Uh, today we're looking at Abraham, and 
Abraham appears in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And we start off in chapter 12 about hearing about Abraham. And so let me uh, read to you this, uh, about the life of Abraham and then we will talk about it. So Abraham appears in chapter 12, the first time in the book of Genesis. That's the first book in the Bible. And the call of Abram, before his name was Abraham, he was called Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse. And by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. So Abram went as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. That's four verses from chapter 12 of the book of Genesis. Remember, pay attention to everything I say because it's all connected, okay? So I remember I said chapter 12. This is chapter 12. Now we're going to go. Uh, what happened here in chapter 12? The Lord made a promise to Abram. Abraham received a promise from God in chapter 12 that he will bless him. He will make him great and he will bless all the nations through him. That's in chapter 12. Then let's go to chapter 15 now of the book of Genesis. Verse 1 through 6. God makes his covenant with Abraham. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abraham did not have a child. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, did not have a child. They're already old. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a slave born in my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your own son shall be your heir. You see, God's giving him a promise here. You will have a son. This is verse 5 now of chapter 15. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. What happened? The Lord spoke his promise to Abraham, and the Bible says, And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned this as righteousness. Now we're going to chapter 18. See how we're moving? We started in chapter 12. So all sorts of stuff is happening in Abraham's life throughout these chapters. Okay, let's go to chapter 16. The birth of Ishmael. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So what happened? God says to Abraham, you will have a son. You will have a son. And then Sarah gets impatient and Abraham is told by his wife, and Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my maid. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So Abraham listens to his wife. So after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. In other words, 
Abraham had relations with Hagar. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. So, Abraham did not remember doubts. He doesn't follow what the Lord tell him, tells him. He follows what his wife says. And, in other words, he doubts. And he has relations with Hagar, and that's how Ishmael is born. Now, chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Now, when the Bible talks about somebody being 99 years old or 100, it doesn't mean that they're 99 or 100. It just means that they're older. Remember, exaggeration in numerical terms, I've told you before, just means that, it's, that they're old. Like when the Bible says 40 days in the desert, doesn't mean that it was 40 days. It just means it was a long time. And the Lord says, And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. We are what is called the faith of Abraham, the great faiths of Abraham, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. This covenant that was made between Abraham and God continues to this very day. And God says, I am your God. The covenant is to be God to you and to your descendants after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her. Her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Now we're going to chapter 18, verse 9. They said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, She's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you in the spring, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I've grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? You see, we laugh at the promises of God. We're like Sarah. We don't believe. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you in the spring, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. She said, and he said, Abraham said, no, but you did laugh. Now, chapter 21. So we started in chapter 12, and now we're going to chapter 21. The birth of Isaac. 
The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham, a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And now, after having Isaac, chapter 22, which we are ending with today. God tests Abraham. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, Here I am. God said, Take your son, your only begotten son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father! And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Then Abraham raised his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only begotten son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only begotten son, I will indeed bless you, and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies." And by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves, because you have obeyed my word. Because you have obeyed my word. Let's go to our notes. Abraham obeyed. Much of what we hear today all around us is much of the preaching and teaching today, especially preaching and teaching that is popular in our country, we see a prostitution of the notion of faith, where we are taught that our efforts need to be placed on getting things from God rather than teaching us how to give God more of ourselves, 
how to give more of ourselves to God. So we hear preachers talk about what can be yours, what you can have, what God can do for you, what you will get in seven days. Send in this offering and this will be yours. Do so many prayers and this will be yours. We hear this all the time. We no longer get challenged at the point of our faith to obey God as our father in faith did Abraham and stop asking God to give us more stuff and to start giving more of ourselves to God. This is called the New Prosperity Faith Movement. It's very popular, particularly in our country, or something else it's called the Wealth Gospel, that God will make you wealthy. If you do such and such a thing, you're going to be rich. That God will obey you, your command. And this is making God an infinite Santa Claus or a holy spiritual slot machine. And our praise is the lever that we pull to manipulate God to give us what we want. It is suggested that if I do this or that, God will then respond and bless me. But if in fact my praise or action can produce my blessing, this suggests that God is impotent against the power of my praise. So if I praise God that, and He has to obey me, that means God is made subject to me and my wants. In other words, this suggests that God has to respond and that God will respond. It makes God a manipulative deity that you can manipulate through your praise or your prayers. If in fact God has to give me what I seek and when I speak, then this suggests that God is so weak that He cannot go against the authority of what I want. And so this is why people run to churches and places and people who no longer preach the sovereignty, that is the independence of God, but who preach a God who serves as a slave as a, to the master of my thoughts and wants. He's mine, and I can do with him what I want, and he will respond to my every beck and call. I just snap my fingers, and God obeys me. So people go to churches that suggest that if I throw enough money on the altar, God will give you this. If you speak in enough tongues, this or that will happen. If you send in the right amount of money, you will be blessed. So you got to do something. And we Catholics are not immune to this because we have many within our midst who live a life of faith in like manner, thinking that if they pray this or that novena this many times, they will get something for it. All you have to do is just pray this prayer and then God will respond. You've heard that before. People giving you things, make sure you do this prayer. And if you do this prayer, God's going to respond to you. That God will hear you. You have to do this or that and then God will act because of what you did. And when they don't get what they want, they throw a tantrum and a fit and they start complaining that God doesn't hear them. And many people just give up altogether because they say, God doesn't hear me. I've done so many things. I've said so many prayers and God didn't hear me. I know many former very deeply religious folks who are now atheists or no, or no longer practice their faith. I was in the seminary with seminarians who they didn't make it to, to the priesthood, but you know, some of them are now atheists because they had this notion. They were so s stringent in their practices. You have to do this and this and this and this, and God will hear me if I do s such and such a thing. God will obey me, you see? And it doesn't work that way. We are to obey God. That's the lesson from Abraham. So many have given up because God disappointed them, they say. You see, this suggests that God is desperate for my praise. 
if I, if I need to do something in order for God to do something to me, that God is up there waiting for me to praise him. God has no need of our praise. You add nothing to God. God is not sitting in glory waiting for you to stroke his ego and that somehow his gratitude for your stroking is going to give you more blessings. I don't want a God who is impotent, that is powerless against my praise. I want a God who has enough power to tell me no when I say yes and to do what is best for me when I don't have enough sense to know what is best for myself. That's the God I want to believe in. You see, God is not after keeping you happy. God is after making you holy. That's what the Bible teaches us. Be holy as your God, as the Lord your God is holy. It doesn't say be happy. And you know something from this life. It's not all happiness. We are after being holy. God's not sitting in heaven trying to make you happy. God is not trying to delight you. He's trying to develop you. And to develop you, he can't always have you happy while you are being developed. Look at the life of Abraham. Was it always happiness? Because you don't grow in happy places. And you know that from your own life. When is it that you have developed the most? When is it that you've grown the most in your life? When you struggled, when you cried, when you went through hell and high water. That's when you developed. You see why God allows the hell in our lives? Mother Teresa went through hell. We will canonize her this coming September in the church. She will be Saint Teresa of Calcutta. For most of our life, you know, when, when a person is getting ready to be canonized, that is named a saint, we examine their life. And we read what they have wrote about their spiritual life. And Mother Teresa recounts in her writings that for 99% of her life, she spent in hell. The definition of hell is the absence of God, where there's no God. That's hell. You can experience hell right here. And many of you may be experiencing hell right now in your life. That's the absence of God. Hell is not just in the afterlife when you don't have God and God's presence. You can have hell right here. And Mother Teresa went for most of her life referring to Jesus as the great absent one, the one who isn't there. Now, if she went through hell in this life for most of her life, what makes you think that you won't be subjected to the same? If it happened to Mother Teresa, why do we think we will escape hell in this life? You see, God brought her through this life and she came out from this life not happy, but holy. Holy. That's what we are after. This life is the process of becoming holy. In other words, you and I are called to be great saints. Each and every one of us. We're not called to be successful here rich, famous. No, we're called to be saints because saints go to be with God and that's what we are after. Are we not? Most of the time, the promises of God, having a son in old age, did you hear that? Abraham has promised a son in his old age. Sound ridiculous. Can you imagine being 99 years old and God telling you, you will have a son? It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Since there is nothing about us that is our ability to get it, you know, our capacity to grasp the promises of God that suggest that we can comprehend the promise. You have to dream the impossible and believe in the impossible. That's what we are called to do. 
If you think you can't get a partner and the notion of actually finding someone seems ridiculous to you, push on. Chances are, if you think your dreams or what you are after in your life seem ridiculous, chances are that's from God. The more ridiculous it sounds to you, chances are that's from God. If you think you can't get the job that makes you fulfilled and makes for you to make enough money to make ends meet, press on. If you think you can't get over a past hurt or move on from something that has happened to you, press on. If you've tried before to get over an addiction and you keep falling and failing, it seems impossible, push forward. Don't give up. If you think your marriage is unsalvageable because you've tried and tried and it seems impossible, press on. Your husband has cheated on you before and you think he can't get better. Give him another chance. It may seem ridiculous, does it not? But press forward. Believe in the unbelievable. You think you will never lose weight. How many people think that, you know, that you will never, I'll never lose weight and I'll never keep it off. It seems ridiculous. It seemed like that in my life too. But now it's been like three years that I've kept off uh, after losing some 150 pounds. It seemed ridiculous. But we are called to press forward. I pressed forward. Press on. Why? Because you are led by God. God is trying to take you somewhere. He's giving you an opportunity to exercise your faith. That's where obedience, faith is about obedience. You know, you may not feel like it. There are many times during the day that I don't feel like doing things. But we press on with trust. Mother Teresa started each and every day of her life with one hour of prayer, even though she doubted that God existed for most of her life. Now, she was able to do it because she pressed forward. She obeyed. She trusted. You have to trust that what he said will come to pass in spite of the fact that you don't see it. You may not see the 150 pounds coming off a year from now. But even though you don't see it, you've got to keep pushing. You may not see the job that you're looking for or the change in your family, but keep pushing for it. You may not see the depression going away, but get the counseling you need and the help you need. You don't put your faith in the process. You put your faith in the promise because the devil shows up in the process because the devil knows he can't do anything about the promise. Because the promise is in God's hands and the process is in your hands. You don't trust the process of getting there. You trust the promise. You're to trust God. The devil knows that if he can drop enough hell on the journey, hence all that hell that Mother Teresa went through, the devil knows that the more hell he will drop on you, that you have to go through, in other words, the more tests that are dropped on you, that you will give up. That's why we pray every time we pray the Our Father, we say, lead us not into temptation. You know what that temptation is? People are confused. How could God lead us to temptation? Temptation, another word for saying temptation is test. Lead us not into the test. Life is full of tests. We don't trust in the process that is full of tests. We trust in the promise. That's what Mother Teresa focused on. The promise, not the process. 
The devil wants you to quit and turn around, which is why while you are walking in the process, you have to keep your mind on the prize, on the promise. Isaac, not get your mind off of it, because when you get your mind off of it, that's when Hagar shows up. You get it? And you end up with Ishmael. <laughs> because when you don't see what God because when you don't see what God said, you have to remember what he said. And you have to keep walking until what he said matches what you see. Mm. God promised and God keeps his promises or he's a liar. Either God keeps his promises or he's a liar. I don't see it yet, but I know what he told me. And I am not going to stop walking until what I see matches what he said. I'm going to keep going. I won't give up. A promise is made to Abraham in chapter 12. Remember I told you to focus? We started with chapter 12. The promise to him of having Isaac was made in chapter 12, was it not? About who he would be, what he would become, that he would be a father of many nations. It is not in the next verse or even in the next chapter that Abraham walks into what God promised him. Now, you see how it's all coming together? Okay. This life, the process is full of tests. What happens after the declaration of the destiny are tests. How many chapters go by before Isaac comes on the picture? Ten. Ten chapters. And in the middle of the fulfillment of the promise, there are tests. That's why I know you will go home today and you will read the book of Genesis. You will read through all of the tests. I don't have the time to read it all here for you, but I will summarize it for you right now. What happens after the declaration of the destiny are tests. Hence why we pray, lead us not into the test. And nevertheless, life is full of tests. Number one test, the family test. He needed to leave the land of his family and go to a land God would show him. Abraham passed the test. The famine test. He failed this one because he doubted God and he went down to Egypt for help. So he failed. He passed one, he failed another one. Now, third test, the fellowship test, where he gave Lot the first choice of the pasture land. He passed this one. The fight test, number four, fourth test where he defeated the kings and he passed the test. So he passed another one. He's got more victories. Sometimes life is like that. Then number five, fifth test. He said no to the wealth of Sodom and he passed the test. See, he's passing tests. The fatherhood test. When Sarah got impatient, when we read this one, didn't we? When Sarah got impatient with God and suggested he go and sleep with Hagar, what happened? He failed. He failed the test. The seventh test. The farewell test. Where he had to get rid of Ishmael in order to get blessed with Isaac. He passes the test. So I find it interesting that God kept allowing Abraham to move forward toward the promise. Even though he wasn't passing every test. You get it? God doesn't, kick, God doesn't kick you to the curb when you fail. God hasn't kicked me to the curb when I fail. And God doesn't kick you to the curb when you fail. When stuff fails, this does, this does not make you a failure. You are not a failure. Even though life may throw that at you, the devil is great at bringing you down and saying, you're a failure. Look at all the, all the tests you failed. Does God kick Abraham to the curb? No. And God will never kick you to the curb either, no matter how many tests you fail. Now, for some here, this is no big news because you are perfect. Okay, I know that. <laughs> you know, there are many in here who came out of their mother's womb in perfection. 
You know, you have every I dotted and every T crossed. But for those of us, the few of us who are here, the few of us who are here, who haven't passed every test, who haven't passed every test in our life, and who don't have every I dotted and every T crossed, for us, this is good news. You see why the Bible is called the good news? This is good news. It's good news for some of us here because God did not disqualify us when we messed up on some of the tests. You see, promotion is not based, promotion is not based on perfection. It's based on progress, that I keep going, moving forward. Hence, I start in chapter 12, and I'm headed to 20, chapter 22. But, you know, even though in chapter 17 I may have failed, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop, because I keep my eyes on the promise. Only church people want you to be perfect. But we here, some of us here, of course, we celebrate not because I don't do it no more, but because I don't do it as often as I used to do it before. You see, you got to learn to celebrate small victories. For example, a year ago, some people say, you know, a year ago, I would have cussed you out. But today, I walked away and cussed under my breath, and that's why I'll celebrate today. <laughs> a year ago, I would have slapped you in your face. But today, I walked away clutching my fist. Okay? A year ago, getting out of the parking lot, I would have shown you the Hawaiian peace sign. <laughs> But today, I'm just going to, under my breath, say something, you know? A year ago, I would have needed a police patrol car to calm me down. But this year, I looked at the bottle and I walked away. And that's why I'll celebrate. I celebrate small victories. You see, one of the things that we have to learn is that our victory is not in the fact that we're going to be victorious over our struggles that we're going to be, oh, perfect. No, our victory is in the struggle. The fact that I get up every day and I say, I'm going to keep going toward the promise. That's where my victory is. And I will celebrate the small victories, even though I may not have achieved the big one yet. We keep struggle, struggling, struggling. Some of you are going to wait to celebrate until you are perfect. But I choose to celebrate because I'm better. So, my marriage may not be perfect, but we are on the way to getting, getting there. We are progressing. We are moving forward. We're not there yet, but it's better than it was five years ago. Or ten years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my family situation may not be better, but we are better today, may not be perfect, but we are better today than we were yesterday. You see why you need to see? I may not be over the death of my loved one yet, but it's better today than it was one month ago. And maybe I'll never get over it. And I would venture to say those of you who have lost a loved one, you know that you will never fully get over it. But you're better today than you were one month ago or one year ago. And I will celebrate the victory I have today, not the victory that I am awaiting tomorrow. I may not have the job I am expecting to have, but it's better than the one I had three years ago. Hmm? The economy of this country is not what I want it to be. But it's better than when we were in the recession and I lost my home. I may not have the church I want to have and I'm working to have, but it's better than the church I had two years ago and I will celebrate that. I may not have the health I want to have, but hey, my health is better today since I beat my cancer five years ago. See, I'm giving you some examples here of reasons to celebrate. Ten chapters go by before the promise comes true. God kept moving Abraham forward, test after test, toward the promise. Some of us in here are on our last test, 
And some of us are on our first test. It takes 10 chapters of preparation before he walks into the manifestation of what God promised him. It's not going to happen overnight. In other words, stop the microwave Christianity where you confess with your lips and believe in your heart and poof, it's all done and you're perfect, you're finished. Don't work that way. Life's great all of a sudden for those who want microwave Christianity. You are not an accident. God doesn't have accidents. You have an assignment and you need to get to a place in order to fulfill your assignment. You don't get finished like this instantly. You're on an assignment. Now you, you, you can't choose the place. God chooses the place. And most of the time, the place God chooses is not where you want to be. In other words, God says to Abraham what? Go to the region of Moriah to a mountain. I will show you. Not go somewhere where you want to go, but go where I will show you. God says, I got something to show you, but I'm going to show you. I'm not going to show you until you go. God says, go. I got something for you, but I want to see if you will trust my direction without having all the answers. Can you trust God without total disclosure? Ask yourself that. Abraham is not given all the answers. He's just given the directions. He knows it's Moriah, but he won't know which mountain until he starts towards Moriah. You know why you are not getting anywhere? Because so many of you are waiting for a sign. Mm -hmm. Why? Why are you not opening a new business, for example? Because I'm waiting for a sign from God. <laughs> I want a sign. Why are you not looking for someone to spend your life with, even though you are lonely? Ah, I need a sign from God. <laughs> I want to go back to school, but I need a sign from God. God told you to start a family, but we are waiting for a sign for the right time. <laughs> Some of you say to God, I trust you, and if you show me, I will move, right? You say, uh, I need a sign from God, and then I will progress, and I will go, right? And God says something different here, doesn't he, to Abraham? What does God say? He says, if you trust me, move, and I will show you. In other words, you got to move. <laughs> God says, will you trust me even if I don't give you everything up front? Does Abraham know everything that's going to happen up front? No, he doesn't. But he moves. That's what your problem is. You don't want to move. Because if God gives you everything up front you will have no need to trust him. That's not trust anymore. God is not after just blessing you. God is after a relationship with you. It's like you have a relationship with other people. God wants a relationship with you too. You got to trust. God told me to move to Las Vegas. Now, I'm not from here. I don't have family here. And when I say God told me, that doesn't mean I'm hearing voices, okay? <laughs> There's a problem if you're hearing voices, okay? <laughs> then don't come and see me. Go see a psychiatrist, okay? <laughs> when I say God told me, we all have a voice inside of us that speaks to us. It's called our conscience. And we know God speaks to us there, inside of us. That's how God speaks to us. In prayer, in our conversation with Him. And so God said, go to Las Vegas. Now, I'm not from here. I don't have family here. But because I trust it, I now have a new family, all of you. Mm -hmm. 
See? <laughs> Blessings flow when you trust. God says, when you trust me without all the answers, I will begin to bless you in ways that will blow your mind. I never imagined I would be at St. Joseph, husband of Mary, but I knew what God was telling me that needed to happen. That where I was was not the place God wanted me to be. And he said, move. And I trusted. I would never imagine, you know, this abundance when you trust God prayer staying in touch with God now Abraham knows the assignment he knows what we read in chapter 22 what did we read the sacrifice of Isaac remember that have you already forgotten okay. uh, but he doesn't know the mountain does he if he doesn't stay in touch with God how do we stay in touch with God through prayer he will be the one to choose the mountain. And if he chooses the mountain, he might not choose the right one. And there is nothing worse than trying to do the right thing on the wrong mountain. There's nothing worse than trying to do the right thing, but in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. That's why you got to stay in touch with God. Prayer, essential. For example, you're 35 and, and your biological clock is ticking and instead of waiting and working on trying to find the right man, you settle down for the right now man. <laughs> or you took a job because it had more money, but it also came with more problems. There's nothing like being on the right mountain. It might not be your neighbor's mountain that looks more appetizing and appealing, as pretty as you might want it to be, or as high as you may have envisioned it to be, but your mountain is the one that fulfills you, brings you delight. Don't compare your mountain to everybody else's, but wake up every morning and thank God for your mountain. Mm. Now, our life is, one of my favorite books is uh, by Charles Dickens, The Tale of Two Cities. And actually, it's b very biblical. And some saints have written about, you know, the, the tale of two cities. It's the one where he talks about the best of times and the worst of times, the age of wisdom and the age of foolishness, the epic of belief and the epic of incredulity. In other words, life is the tale of living in two opposites. The success of life is not trying to live in one city or the other, but the success of life is knowing how to live in both at the same time in such a way that your attitude doesn't give away which city you are in at a given time, whether you are in hell or heaven. Attitude. Can people tell whether I am catching hell, hell, or living in heaven? It's very important. What is our attitude? So Abraham takes Isaac to worship. Did you notice that uh, God says, take Isaac and you're going to sacrifice him? What do we do when we gather for worship? We have sacrifice. It's called the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and we have at the center of our celebration is the altar. God makes Abraham carry the fire, the wood, and the knife, does he not? In order to worship. God is making him carry the ingredients that he will use to kill Isaac. God makes them carry stuff that has the potential to kill. Stuff that is painful, depressing, discouraging. In other words, welcome to life. What do you do when God makes you carry stuff to worship that has the potential to kill you? God doesn't want you to leave your issues in the car. God is not after having you hide your issues, but carry them. In other words, deal with them. God wants you to deal with your problems. 
We're going to have a retro Vi weekend. Father Tom, one of our wonderful priests here at uh, St. Joseph, husband of Mary, is involved in the retro Vi program. And the second weekend in April in Boulder City will be a retro Vi weekend. It's for marriages who are in trouble. It's a whole weekend retreat for marriages who are on the rocks. If you're having issues in your marriage, it's a great thing for you to consider. Move, in other words. Starting AA if you have a problem with alcohol. Facing your addictions. God wants you to deal with what you're facing. Getting counseling for past issues or going to confession today would be wonderful if you haven't been in a long time. So I want you to ask yourself, what are you carrying that has the potential to kill you? What are you carrying? A bad marriage? People that are toxic in your life? Bad company? I was told from a very early age what I put here in Polish. Okay? Z jakim się przestajesz, takim się stajesz. I know you will remember that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, basically, to translate it, it's z uh, jakim przestajesz, takim się stajesz means the, the people that you hang out with, you become like them. Maybe you got to get rid of some of the people in your life. Mm -hmm. That girlfriend that you have that gossips all the time, maybe she ain't such good company, huh? Mm -hmm. You've got cancer or another sickness maybe that you're carrying, family struggles, work issues. I don't know. You know. Everybody's got stuff. Personal issues like depression and anxiety. You can't make ends meet, pay your bills. What are you carrying? You are on the verge of losing your home, being foreclosed upon. You are underemployed. Your health is bad. You can't seem to lose weight. What is it that you need to do? You drive by the Las Vegas Athletic Club and they have $5 signs to start, but you drive by. You just drive by. Okay? Just giving you a clue here. Okay. You're underemployed. You got a job you can't stand. You have pain from losing a loved one that is killing you. You have pain from the betrayal of your spouse that cheated on you or your parents that hurt you. You have pain from being raped, abused, mistreated. You have a loved one in your life that with their attitude is killing you. The reason why you should rejoice and be glad is that with everything you are carrying, you still came today. In other words, you still came to worship. We're praising God here. We're giving Him glory. We started off that way. The, the, you know, what you're carrying is not as important as the fact that you're here. That's what's important. With everything you are carrying that is killing you or that has the potential to kill you, you are here today to hear and to proclaim, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I will climb that mountain. I will keep going. I'll fight every devil that's trying to bring me down. I will not give up. I will not give in. I will carry it. And I will climb that mountain with a smile, with integrity, giving praise to God. I will carry it with joy and hold my head up high. Abraham made an altar with the stuff he was carrying to worship. You and I are called to take the stuff we carry and build an altar and leave it there for the Lord and to trust that the Lord will provide. Abraham when does God say to Abraham, look, look at this, this is very, this, this is, you know, I always save the best things for last. But when, when does the angel of the Lord say, put the knife down? Enough. When Abraham raises his hands with the knife, 
when he raises his hands. You ever seen people who praise the Lord and they raise their hands? What do we do when we pray the Our Father? What, does the, what is the position of the priest? It's called the Oran's position. It's the most ancient form of praying. From the ancient days of the church, putting our hands up like this. It's a position of surrender. When Abraham surrenders, when he surrenders, the voice of the Lord comes and says, Enough! When does God show up? When Abraham puts his hands up, when you say the only way these issues, these problems, these obstacles are going to get fixed in my life is if you step in, Lord, and help me fix it, I surrender it all to you. In other words, the impossible situation, we put our hands up. Now, think about this. This is not such a new thing. You know this. I'm just putting it for you in different terms. You've heard of the Alcoholics Anonymous program. It's a 12-step program. What's the first step there? It's admitting that you have a problem. And what's the second part of the first step? Saying that alone, you will not get out of the problem. Alone, you won't get through the problem. That you need the help of a higher power, right? And this is a secular program that says you need God's help. First you admit it, and then you throw your hands up in the air and say, alone I can't do it, I need you. So, put your hands up. Mm -hmm. Put your hands up. That's what we have to do. And then what happens? In other words, when Abraham puts his hands up and surrenders to God, God says, enough, it's over. The test is ended. And that's what we have to trust in our life. That if we go through life trusting in God, obeying the Lord our God, not wanting God to obey us, but us obeying God, that there will come a time as there came in the life of Abraham that says, enough! It's over! Now, Moriah, did you not hear the mountain? Moriah? What's the name of the mountain? Moriah. I know you're getting ideas for the names of your kids or your grandkids here, okay? <laughs> Moriah! In English, it's translated as more. More. That's what the English translation of Moriah is. More. Abraham leaves the land of more, but doesn't leave more with more. His obedience has not produced more. He is obedient, and all he has to show for it is Isaac. He went with Isaac and leaves with Isaac. He goes through the valleys, climbs the mountains. Did you hear how many chapters there were? He went through the valleys, climbs the mountains, and all he has to show for it is Isaac. In other words, he's got what he started with. And so, you may not have the house you desire, but you have a house. That's why you should praise the Lord today. You may not have the house you want, but at least you have somewhere to live. You don't live in a cardboard box like the majority of people in the world. You're not a Syrian refugee, are you? Maybe that's why you should rejoice. Instead of saying, oh, I don't have to do it. <laughs> so, you don't have the husband you imagine you would have. But at least you have one. Look around. I just look around over here. You have no idea how many... Uh, of People have come to me here, you know, some of the wonderful ladies who are here and say, I want a man, Father. You know, you're not like that. You got one. Rejoice! <laughs> you may not have the one you want or wanted, but you got one. <laughs> So you don't have the job you want, but you've got one. How many people are unemployed? 
So you may not have the kids you wished for, but you've got children. You know how many couples I meet who can't have children? It's one of the most painful things. And you'd say, well, they didn't turn out like I wanted them to. <laughs> so you don't get a different body. But at least you can move your hands and feet and you've got eyes to see. So you don't have the church you would want, but you've got one. So you don't have the priest you would long to have, but you've got one. <laughs> So you don't have the new wardrobe you desire, you know, and I, I can just see, you know, the, the, sometimes um, when people invite me to their homes and then especially like to bless their home or whatever, when I go to their homes and sometimes, you know, I say, can I have a tour? I just want to look around. Okay. And I know some of you are going to say, I'll never invite him now. <laughs> and I look and there's boxes, you know, the, what they have doesn't fit in the closet. And yet you... I, I just, and you, yet you get up in the morning and you say, I just don't have anything to wear. <laughs> so you may not have a new wardrobe, but you've got clothes. So you don't get to eat at Gordon Ramsay's or Wolfgang Puck, but at least you got food. In other words, you're maintaining and you should rejoice and be glad with all the people losing their jobs, I've got one. With all the people with cancer, I'm really well off. With all the people losing their homes, I have a place to live. With all the folks with no family, dying of loneliness, I thank you, Lord, for the problematic, dysfunctional family that I have. <laughs> With all the women in here who wish they had a husband, I thank you for the one I have. I can't say that enough. All you ladies, I don't have more money in the bank, more clothes in my closet, more cars in my driveway, but I'm maintaining and I bless you for it, Lord. I bless you because I woke up with my sanity, my peace, my joy, my family, my smile. In other words, it could always be worse. So you want to complain because you want more? No, praise him today because you got Isaac. And God says what? If you keep on trusting me, there is more in store than Isaac because what came after Isaac? This is where we rejoice today especially. There's more peace, more smiles, more glory, more joy. There's more. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. That's why he got more than Isaac, because he trusted. Jesus is coming. And you know why you and I should rejoice today? Because you and I are far better off than Abraham, because we already have Jesus. And when you have Jesus, you have everything. And that's why we will rediscover Jesus by reading Matthew Kelly's book, which you will head to over there. There's a book there for all of you uh, to take on your way out today as we end with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Lord, today for not just the Isaac in our lives, but most especially for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came that we might have life and have it in abundance. And today we want to rededicate ourselves to the process, to the arduous process, to going through the tests and through enduring the tests and to always keeping our eyes on the promise and to trusting in the promise, not in the process as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. And we
we surrender ourselves to the Lord by saying, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, shall be, world without end. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, stay seated for two minutes, okay? Our next class is not until Monday, April 4th, because of Lent and Holy Week and everything going on Easter, and not until Monday, April 4th. That will give me three weeks to prepare, so oh, hopefully it'll be good, okay? Uh, and if you haven't signed in, please do sign in in the back with your name and your email and print, print. And also, uh, tell other people to make sure they come next time, okay? And uh, remember, we have those books, Rediscovering Jesus. They're available for all of you. To, so please go over there and pick up a book and read it. And only take it if you're going to read it. It's on your conscience, okay? So only take the book if you're going to be committing to reading it. And it's very easy, very easy to read. It's very easy to read. And thank you for being here. God bless all of you. Thank you.